All right, students, let's take some notes on solutions and solubility. Remember, because this is video notes, you can always pause if you need a little bit more time writing down or pondering, or you can always scrub back or rewind if you need to go back and revisit a concept. Let's get started. Let's start with the essential question. Go ahead and pause the video and write down the essential question. How can we predict how ionic salts act in solution? For this unit, we want to focus on two main points. So this is just kind of a preview page of what's going to happen for this entire unit. The first question we're going to be asking for these specific notes are, does the stuff dissolve? And that deals with the term called solubility. Later on in a different set of notes, possibly a different video, we're going to talk about how much of the stuff dissolves. And that deals with concentration. But let's focus on the first one for now. You need to know about three terms, solvent, solute, and solution. And I really like this picture here and almost recommend that you draw the picture before even writing any definition. But let's go ahead and add some definitions just in case. The solvent is the material that does the dissolving. Usually in this case, or in this case, and usually it's water because water is a universal solvent, but it could be any other liquid. Usually this liquid is present in the largest amounts and is one of the key indicators to know that that's the solvent. The solute is the material that you want to dissolve. Now, I like to think of these two kind of like when I mix hot cocoa, right? I usually have my cocoa powder, which is my solute, and the water, the hot water, is the solvent. And that's how those two work. When I mix them together, I get something called the solution, which is just the combination of the solute and the solvent. So solubility is what we're talking about today. Today, And what exactly is solubility? Well, it's just the ability of a substance to dissolve. And we want to know whether a substance can dissolve or not. So we're going to be talking about how we can recognize that. First of all, if a substance is soluble, we say that it is able to be dissolved in water. And we usually designate that symbol as aqueous, because aqueous means dissolved in water. So that's the phase symbol we would use next to our chemical formula. Insoluble, on the other hand, means that it does not dissolve in water. In fact, what happens is, is it might even come out of the dissolved part and become undissolved, or we call that a precipitate or a solid. It might show up as a solid chunk. So we usually use S as the phase symbol to designate that. Now, one thing to watch out for, don't confuse S for soluble. Yes, soluble starts with an S, but soluble is aqueous and insoluble is solid. One more you need to know is water, H2O. We're going to see water a lot. And please realize that water is a liquid. Instead of being, it's not aqueous because it's not dissolved in water. It is water. And it's not a solid because it's a liquid. So water is a liquid. All right, so I want to talk about what happens when ions dissolve in a solution or what happens when we take a compound like a powder and it dissolves in a solution. Well, ionic compounds tend to break apart into their separate ions in solution. So let's look at here as an example. Here's sodium chloride. Let's say we have table salt. This is the table salt like you would dump out of a salt shaker. And we want to go ahead and add it to water. So what's going to happen is, is we're going to come up with something called a sodium chloride aqueous um, product. And that's all that means. We just dissolved salt in water. Another way to look at it, one I like a little bit more is actually, this is what's really going on. Here we have sodium chloride dissolved in water again. And what's really happening here is so the sodium ions separate from the chlorine ions and they become their ionic particles. They break apart into both positive and negative charges. So let's take a look at that with this animation. Here we're having a salt shaker. and We're going to shake those salt particles in the water and they're going to dissolve. And if you look closely, water is coming up and literally tearing apart the sodium chloride, it's tearing apart the positive and the negative ions, so they're free floating separately in the water. I think that's really cool and one of a really cool thing about water molecules. And this is due to water molecules polarity. Because water has a, is a polar molecule, both ends of water, the, positive, the partial positive and the partial negative ends, are able to rip apart those particles. Now, one thing to note, we just created an electrolyte. An electrolyte is just a salt in water, or literally it's just ions that are dissolved in water. Electrolytes are really important to us. They're an essential part of our body, and they're an essential part of many chemical reactions that we do. For our body, they do things like balance fluids, they maintain the blood's proper pH, and they carry electrical signals. Remember, we dissolve ions in solution, so we have a solution that can be electrically conductive. All right, but let's go one step further. 
we were just looking at one compound, but what happens if we take two solutions and mix them together? That's ultimately what we're trying to get at. So here we have two solutions. So up here in this upper beaker, we have potassium iodide that was dissolved in water. So here we have the potassium particles and the iodine particles that are free floating in that water. In this lower beaker, we have uh, lead to nitrate. And so again, lead to nitrate was dissolved. So we have the lead and the nitrate particles that are free floating in the lower liquid. Now these two things are gonna go through a chemical reaction. They're gonna rearrange. In fact, they're gonna go through something called the double replacement reaction, which we'll talk about in more detail. And they're gonna switch their partners. Now, some of them are gonna form relationships. They're gonna form new bonds and some of them are not and we're gonna be able to predict what happens. So here's our final product of this reaction. Here we can see as part of our product equation, here's potassium and nitrate. They stay in aqueous format, meaning that they're dissolved. They don't really react, and that's that clear liquid you see up here. Down here we see a yellow solid, or we would call that a yellow precipitate, and that's because lead to iodate, iodide comes out of the solution and forms an insoluble precipitate. And that's really cool. But how do we predict that that's going to happen? So there's our soluble product and our insoluble product. So remember, the insoluble product, this is basically a driving force. It's a formation of a precipitate. In order to predict this, whether a product is going to be soluble or insoluble, we use something called solubility rules. In fact, I might pause the video right now, pull out your periodic table, and look on the back you should have this list of solubility rules on the back of your periodic table. Now, this is just a list of rules that tell you whether a reaction will form a precipitate or be soluble or not. So let's go ahead and see how these rules work. Now, the way you use these rules is basically two things. The first thing you do is look at the anion of the product and see if it's in there. So let's take a look at this first one. Here's potassium nitrate. Let's say we did a reaction and we know that potassium nitrate is gonna be one of the products. The first thing you're gonna look about is the nitrate. Notice that the nitrate is found here and it's under the soluble category. So this, this product right here is most likely soluble. But before we actually mark that, let's just check the other part. It says next check the cation. Let's check the positive thing or the potassium if it's an exception. Notice that nitrate does, has no exceptions. Even potassium's not on there. So yes, indeed, this first product here is aqueous or soluble. So that's not going to be very fascinating. If we mix that, this is still going to be a dissolved solution. Let's try the next one, silver chloride. Well, again, let's look at the chlorine first. That's our anion, our negatively charged things. Oh, I, again, I see chlorine is soluble right here. But before I put that down as aqueous, let's just see if there's any exceptions. Oh, hey, here's silver. Silver is an exception. So what that means is even though chlorine is soluble, the silver flips it and it becomes insoluble. So silver chloride is actually insoluble because that silver right there is an exception when it's attached to chlorine. I would recommend pausing the video right now and seeing if you can figure out the last two on your own. Did you pause it? Did you try it? I hope you did. If so, let's check your work. Well, calcium sulfate is aqueous. To know why, well, first look at sulfate. Sulfate is our anion. So I look down here, sulfate is insoluble. So it, we should write an S, but let's go look at the exceptions really quick. Oh, hey, I see calcium. Calcium, if it's connected to sulfur, is an exception. So it flips it and it becomes soluble. So in this case, calcium sulfide, even though sulfide should technically be insoluble, the calcium makes it aqueous. All right, last one, calcium carbonate. Again, let's look at carbonate. Carbonate is right here. It says it is insoluble. So we can write an S and let's just double check. I see over here that calcium is not an exception. Calcium is not an alkali metal, it's an alkali earth metal, so we're safe. But if it was sodium or potassium or, or lithium or any of the other alkali metals, then I might have to flip that. But that's basically it. I hope you guys are, understand that and are able to do it. Good luck.